Pretrial and probation professionals have a great deal of influence in outcomes for individuals in the criminal justice system. I realize that's a truism that everybody in this room knows. We are fortunate to have the top experts to share their knowledge on best practices and challenges to implementing alternatives at the pretrial stage. Moderating this session is Chief Christine Dozier, the Chief U.S. Pretrial Services Officer for the District of New Jersey, and someone whose name we've already heard mentioned several times yesterday as well as today. Chris is a deeply respected and admired leader within the pretrial community, bringing fresh perspectives to her own jurisdiction and to jur jurisdictions all around the country. Enjoy. Thank you, Gary. I'm going to break from tradition here, and we're going to use our PowerPoints because we're visual. We like PowerPoints. <clears throat> so um, I'm very pleased to be moderating this distinguished panel. With me today are uh, a group of professionals in their right. Mike Williams is the Senior Manager of Adult Policy at Pew and formerly a career professional with DC Pretrial, the model for state pretrial systems. Um, Next to Mike is Dr. Kevin Wolf, assist, assistant professor of the doctoral study programs at John Jay College, um, where he recently received recognition, one of only six assistant professors um, out of hundreds who received uh, an award for his work. And um, Dr. Wolf is working with us in the federal system on ATI programs, and we're going to hear about that. Next to Kevin is Mark Jelli. And now that I've pronounced his name right, I can drop the mic and leave the stage. Yeah. Very impressive, too. <laughs> and Mark is the Deputy Chief Probation Officer in the Federal uh, District of the Eastern District of New York and an adjunct professor, professor of criminal justice. And last but certainly not least, Vincent Giraldi, Senior Research Scientist at Columbia School of Social Work the co-director of the Columbia Justice Lab and formerly New York City Probation Commissioner. Please join me in welcoming them. So this topic of evidence-based sentencing alternatives, um, I think we could agree all three branches of government are on board with reducing incarceration. Uh, in the executive branch, we see the First Step Act and, and in this administration and Smart on Crime in the previous. In the legislative branch, the Colson Task Force has talked about the lack of diversion and problem, looking at problem-solving courts and evidence-based probation. And in the judiciary, our criminal law committee chair, Irene Keeley, former chair, testified before the Colson Task Force about the lack of diversion, less than 1% in the federal system, traditional diversion, and how ATIs are underutilized, even though judges have the authority to do it more than they do, and they do not take advantage of it. So the support is there, but how do we do it? The devil is in the details, as always. So we're going to talk about some evidence-based sentencing um, opportunities, but before we do that, before we talk about how to reduce mass incarceration, we cannot have a meaningful discussion about it unless we talk about pretrial detention. I'm a pretrial chief. What did you expect to hear? Um, but um, this article, this is not a new topic. This article was written in 2011 by Cadigan and Lowenkamp. And they're asking the question pre-entry, which they're talking about the front end, right? Pretrial release. Pre-entry, the key to long-term criminal justice success, question mark. They're asking the question, is the front end important for long-term criminal justice success? And undoubtedly, the evidence has been mounting. It is. This is just a smattering of the research that's out there. And, uh, Marie Van Nostrin has done much of this, Chris Lowenkamp who works with the AO, um, but this is what the evidence is telling us about the front end impact. That detained defendants are twice as likely to fail post-conviction supervision, twice as likely to fail if we detain them. That pretrial detention results in more incarceration and longer incarceration, significantly longer and more incarceration. 
Defendants were released most successful. That's a no-brainer. Uh, defendants who are detained least successful, two times more likely to get custodial sentences. Um, even those who are released and revoked do better than those who were never released. Do you, do you think that is related to the fact that they were incarcerated pretrial, or do you think it's because they were accused of more serious crimes and therefore they were uh, incarcerated no, pretrial? This is controlling for all those factors. These are equally situated people. It's because they don't get the opportunity to put their best foot forward with the court. Judge Carr is here. Judge Carr wrote an article. If you haven't read it, please do so. Why pretrial release really matters. And in it, he talks about the hinge moment, the importance of the in-out decision. And many people will say that that in-out decision is the most important decision. Judge Carr is quoted as saying, except for the district judge's decision at sentencing, no decision in any criminal case is more important or consequential. It is because defendants who are released get the opportunity to participate in programming, therapeutic, to work, to support their families, to put their best foot forward if they are eventually convicted and appear before a judge for sentencing. It is, it is culture that is driving the high detention rate. And here to talk about that, Mike Williams is a uh, career-long professional at D.C. pretrial. As I said, D.C. is the model for the state's 85% release rate with very high compliance rates. So, Mike, I'm going to ask you, why, if this is the case and all this evidence exists about the importance of the front end, is uh, aren't people getting released? We have a detention crisis, and what is Pew doing about it? Good afternoon. It's really good to be here. Um, I'd like to thank Alice and those uh, responsible for my invitation. Um, as Chris mentioned, um, I have spent the past 20 years working in uh, pretrial services, the last five of which have had the opportunity to kind of go around and talk about these issues and really hear from the states um, where pretrial detention is the norm, as opposed to in the District of Columbia where it is absolutely the exception. Um, and that happens to, in, the, in the district, just a quick note, um, our pretrial program provides pretrial services to both the local court as well as the federal court. And so we get to see on both ends um, the detention rates um, and, of course, on the, on the federal side, they're a little higher, um, but the outcomes for those who are released are almost identical to those on the local level. And just a, a quick answer to Chris's question, one of the reasons is statutes. Um, and so when I've gone around the country to various jurisdictions and states and cities, the statutes allow for detention. And in some places, the statutes don't allow, and the judges do it anyway. And that's at the local level. And so I think it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, Pew, um, I've been at Pew for six months, so I'm brand new at Pew, having a good time uh, getting out and really trying to understand the, the intersection between what's happening, uh, what we're finding on the research side versus what's, what's actually happening um, on the ground level. Um, and so Pew has spent the last 20 or so years um, conducting research and then are trying to apply that research in states through our technical assistance projects, um, mainly in the areas of sentencing and corrections reform. Um, about a year ago, Pew decided we're going to get out of the sentencing and corrections lines of work and we're going to get into pretrial and jail issues and then our next line of work is probation and parole so today i'm really glad to be here to talk to you about our pretrial and jails work so pretrial detention two major impacts right off the um right from the start high, high volume of jail admissions and we're going to see that i was mentioned earlier about the number of admissions into local jails throughout the country. The number is extremely high. And then uh, pretrial detention is often decided by a person's access to money and not public safety. So here we see it. 
uh, our jail population growth since uh, 1985 has tripled, tripled in the last um, 30 or so years. I mean, and that number continues to rise. Jail admissions are not slowing down, um, and we continue to see these, these high growth. One of the things that we're starting to look at when, in our jail work is that it's not it's pretrial admissions, but it's also just who long lengths of stay. So typically, there used to be a, uh, the norm was a year in jail or so um, would be the, uh, on the top end, but we aren't seeing that now. We're seeing longer lengths of jail stay. We're seeing an increasing number, and this is off topic, but it's important to note, increasing number of jail admissions that are stemming from probation and parole revocations. Um, those numbers continue to go up, and I think um, Vinny's gonna talk about that a little later. So here you see our jail versus our prison population. You can see um, the jail population is in the one million range of prison population is about 1.5, but look at the admissions. Look, the number of admissions far outpaces the number of um, in jail, jail admissions, far outpaces the number of prison admissions. Um, recidivism outcomes of pretrial detention, and Chris mentioned some of these, 30% uh, more new felony charges for those detained pretrial, uh, future criminal charges more likely for those detained pretrial, higher recidivism for low and moderate risk defendants who have been detained pretrial. So we have low risk people who we are incarcerating in our local jails who end up coming back more often than those who have been released and given an opportunity to participate in programs and to maintain their lives um, while they've been out on release. And then pretrial detainees, Chris mentioned this exactly, pretrial detainees are more likely to be sentenced and receive longer sentences compared to defendants who are out of jail during the pendency of the cases. On a human level, what's the impact? First, let me just start by talking about the cost of this. So local communities are spending at least $14 billion every year to detain people who have not been convicted of the charges against them. These costs are being borne by the counties, the local counties who run most of the jails in the country, um, and those costs are astronomical. And when we talk to sheriffs and county executives, um, they decry this cost because it's a cost that could go somewhere else. These are resources that could go to mental health and substance use disorder treatment um, that are being spent to detain people who really pose very little risk to the community. And so on a human level, you know, our people who are detained pretrial, and earlier today I heard the um, three-day rule. I'm not sure about the three-day rule. I don't want to see some more research, but I know it's significant, though, because we see, I, I've seen it in my own uh, career, people risk losing their jobs, falling behind in school, not getting the needed health care and social services, losing housing, and in some cases, actually losing custody of their children. And so the cost to the state, to the county, and to the individual are significant of pretrial detention. And so from Pew's perspective, we, we are in the process of researching um, all the different money bail litigation that's going on around the country. Um, mental illness in the jail population is a huge problem. I heard the panelists earlier um, talk about pre-arrest diversion, and I know in the District of Columbia we were really pushing that, we were having a hard time getting it uh, kicked off, but that was one of the initiatives that was um, moving forward as I was uh, transitioning. And then the growing cost to counties. We do a lot of work with uh, local counties, and we constantly hear about these costs. Um, and these costs are driven, as I said earlier, driven and tied to state policy. Um, Pew has just launched its first um, technical assistance project around uh, pretrial and jail issues, and we um, started work about two months ago in the state of Michigan. Um, we're really excited about it. Um, one of the challenges, and I think it's been talked about here, is the data collection. Um, so I have a, a staff of maybe three traveling all 86 counties in the state of Michigan trying to pull data in many cases manually. Um, and so as a, as a criminal justice issue, you know, we, we need to continue to look at the data and how we're collecting the data and where it's being stored and how we extract that data so that we can make sound policy decisions. And then here's our, our new direction, things that uh, states and counties across the country are taking a fresh look at. Um, as I mentioned, data collection is at the top of the list, pretrial release, looking at all these people who are being detained on low-level charges, um, diversion and, de and deflection. You know, if we can, we, 
we can divert more people out of the system than we currently do. I think we just have to find the will. Court processes, uh, we're looking at case processing times, um, and I don't, I'm not as familiar on the federal side, but I do know on the local side, it takes a long time often for case to be processed, which lengthens the time the person is being detained. Um, mental health, huge issue across the board in all of our work um, in jails and pretrial, probation and parole, um, mental health is a really big issue. And then looking at new funding for county innovation, we've been working with all of the foundation community um, to draw up resources and bring um, partners who've traditionally acted alone together. So we've partnered with the Arnold Foundation, with Vera, um, with the Council of State Governments, um, and many others to try to bring together all of the resources that, um, that are needed to make an impact. But just to, to touch back on some of what Mike said and, and a couple of the, the evidence-based things I was mentioning before, Marie Van Nostren's research with the Arnold Foundation, Luminosity, her company, even 24 hours of custody increases failure because people lose their job, they lose their benefits, families break up over this kind of thing. So we just have to make sure we're not just taking it for granted that we can hold somebody, we'll make a decision later, that's not a big deal, because it can be for some people. 14% less likely to be found guilty if released. Um, and the risk principle, that um, some of these conditions of release are really effective on higher risk cases, some moderate risk cases, but when we overcondition low risk cases, they fail at a much greater rate. Um, and some Chris Lowenkamp research that um, pretrial, success on pretrial is predictive of success post-conviction. So that's something for judges to consider when they're looking for alternatives to detention. Now, there are some distinctions between the federal and the state and local systems. Um, while a lot of uh, similarities exist, um, there are distinctions. And in the federal system, the investigations are done um, for months, even sometimes years in advance. So they tend to have the goods when the feds come knocking. So 90 percent, uh, give or take, 90 plus percent conviction rate, and about 90 percent go to prison. So there's a real need for this, and this um, mass incarceration and the mass detention that leads to mass incarceration is a lot of the impetus that got um, a number of us starting this proliferation of front end specialty courts. And um, so before this can become policy in our system, it has to be researched and the data has to support it as an evidence-based and effective program. And so that's why seven districts joined forces and we contracted with John Jay and Kevin Wolf, who has just been amazing to work with. I worked with him on one research project on location monitoring, which by the way, another uh, evidence-based practice in New Jersey, and then it was replicated in the, um, at our administrative office that electronic monitoring on high-risk cases reduces recidivism. It will increase failure putting it on lower-risk cases. Uh, so Kevin did that study with us. Uh, we published, and uh, we brought him in to do a study on alternatives to incarceration. So on that note, we're going to turn it over to Kevin. Thanks, Chris. Try to talk into this. All right, so we're talking about the study with seven districts in the federal court or federal system um, where there was a number of programs that were evaluated. So here are the seven districts that played along with us and the name of their programs because we love acronyms. Um, I'm not going to sit up here and read those. But importantly, we looked at all of these programs as an aggregate rather than individual. There's a couple inherent limitations with that. We can't say which one of these programs was having effects and which ones weren't. But that was due to the small numbers. And I'll get to the, the final number here. But some of these programs are new within the last couple years with only a handful to 20 participants, that program at this stage in the game is really not something you can evaluate. Um, you can point to successes, you can point to their outcomes, but actually evaluating like we did here, it, it's not possible. So we, we lumped them together to kind of capture a picture of ATI programs in the federal system and to examine some of their potential effects. Um, 
So we drew data from the PACS system, which those of you who are in the federal system know what PACS is. There, there were some challenges inherent in that, but we drew data on nearly 14,000 defendants from that system. Of that 13,900 or so defendants, 534 had participated in one of those programs on the slide before. We wanted to try to break up that 534 into a couple different groups based on program type. I use quotation marks there because that actually proved dis difficult as well. Um, one clear program type was programs designed for substance abuse individuals or people that are having problems with substance abuse and criminality related to that. The second was programs designed for youthful defendants. It, within the language of the program, these programs were set up for youthful defendants in the federal system. And then the remainder were kind of this catch-all category. Actually, in the program language, there was real no discerning characteristics that we could point to. So judges are making the decision, or attorneys, that actually varies across programs too, who makes the admins decision, but we're kind of a catch-all program. Of that 534, 72% of the participants were successful, meaning they completed the program. And I'm gonna break up results by both these things, unsuccessful and successful, as well as by those program types. All right. To look at this, what we used was a matching design, and I'm sure you guys have read some research on matching design, so I'm going to compare this 500, roughly 500 ATR participants with a group of defendants that look exactly like them based on a number of characteristics. I'll go into those characteristics here in a second, um, but we match them based on their propensity to join an ATI program. So you're actually predicting the probability that they would have been allowed to join an ATI program given that chance. We also match on the district and the year that they were in just to control for some other factors there. Um, I can get into the technical stuff, but I don't think it's the arena for that, so I'm just gonna keep moving on. If we have questions, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, but basically, from that 14,000, that pool of 14,000, I pull out another 500 that match in terms of race, terms of age, terms of gender, terms of offending history, terms of incident offense, in terms of all the conditions of their pretrial release. There's 21 or 22 factors that we match on there, if you include district. And then we look at their differences across those two groups. Um, there are a number of ways to do this match, and there's a whole literature on which is the most appropriate. We've actually did it a number of ways in this study to show that our results are not sensitive to that, but the one-to-one -one matching makes it pretty nice. All right, why match? Because if we look at this, the ATI participants, they're more likely to be women than in the population of defendants, 50% versus 78% in the ATI program. ATI participants were actually younger than the general population of defendants. 32 years old versus 40. Whites were a higher percentage of ATI participants. Hispanics were also a higher percentage than they represented in the general population of defendants. It's some of these differences that are important. I, I did not list all the differences and I have a really big table in the report if you wanna see it, but they were actually different on all 20 of our, 21 of our different characteristics. So it's not comparing apples to apples if you don't do something to match them. I can't just say our group did this and then general defendants do that. That's not a fair comparison. Um, so we match based on that. Let's get to the outcomes because we, we want to stay on track here. Um, looking at all ATI participants, let's make sure we're all looking at the same thing. We have three general and traditional pretrial failure things. So failure to appear, rearrest, or technical violations. You see at the bottom of this figure, since the transitions aren't in here anymore, um, that for all ATI participants, we have about 1.4% failed to appear. Compare that to 1.6% of the comparison group. No big difference there, not statistically significant. They actually didn't vary significantly among all ATI participants on rearrest or total technical violations there. Again, I'm gonna blow through some of these numbers because there's a lot more to come. If you want a copy of the report, happy to share it. Um, but highlighting some of the findings, the important findings, if you look at successful ATI cases, those individuals that successfully completed the ATI program, we saw a, a st 
statistically significant difference in rearrest. So the 2.1 percent versus 6.1 percent was significant. Well, we we use some fancy statistics, not that fancy, but um, so that that is an important finding. Moving on. We didn't want to just look at those three basic outcomes. We wanted to look at some other leveraging the PACT data. A couple other outcomes we looked at were the percentage of days worked while on pretrial supervision. Um, among all ATI participants, again, the difference wasn't huge, although this was significant. Around 43% of the days worked for ATI participants. The match comparison group was just over, just around 39%. Um, the second outcome was percentage of drug tests. It's important to note that we use the percentage of drug tests with a positive result, not just the number of positive results, because those individuals in ATI programs are often subject to a greater number of tests. So we wanted to use a percentage of those tests that came back with a positive result. Differences were modest around 10.5% to 15%. The differences are bigger, again, among successful ATI participants. I'm not going to say all these numbers because we'll just get crisscrossed, but those differences are significant here. ATI <coughs> participants who were successful worked a greater number of days and tested positive a smaller percentage of the time. Since we are at this summit on incarceration, we should probably look at outcomes, and these are some of the more dramatic findings. So looking at the ATI cases only, we found that because the 72% are successful overall, 43% of, of those cases were dismissed or had their prosecutions deferred and then were dismissed. So it's a large chunk of that 534 were dismissed. Um, a small percentage received time served and then just were supervised. There's 22% on um, received a probation term, and then 32% went on to receive a prison term. Looking more carefully at the successful individuals, though, these differences get even larger. So around 50%, 49% were dismissed outright. The proportion on probation remains the same, but the prison, the percentage that got prison shrunk. Okay, last group, though, is the unsuccessful participants. I, th I think it's an okay thing, if we want to talk about justice, that none of them had their cases dismissed, right? The people that failed out of a program when they were given this relatively limited chance in the federal thing, in the federal system. Many of them, 77%, ended up with a prison sentence. But let's look when we compare those folks to their matched cases. I know, again, lots of numbers. Um, again, when we match these two people who also, who had the defendants, uh, the dispositions of the match defendants, we see some pretty large differences. So again, that 43% that had their cases dismissed is a large number, especially in the federal system where Chris just cited a 90% conviction rate often carries a prison sentence. So that is a large chunk that are getting dismissed outright. We also see differences between probation and prison where a smaller proportion are getting prison sentences while probation remains about the same. So the real difference is getting a deferred or dismissed versus going to prison, which is, a, I think we always assume that ATI works. These differences are even larger among successful ATI participants, but importantly, there are no differences for unsuccessful participants. If we're talking about saving time and money and the human cost here, we can also look at a group that was matched to the group that was outright dismissed. So, is this right? See group match. Yes. So if I'm looking just at the group that was matched to defendants, ATI defendants that were dismissed outright, they had no sentence. I can look at the group that was matched to them and we see a mean probation time of 39 months, a mean prison time of 26 or almost 27 months, and then to uh, time under supervision, 128 months. That's a large amount of savings because we have around 50% were dismissed outright. So their match group had spent time in prison, spent time on probation, cost money, cost, cost them and freedom. Um, I'm going to just skip that one. It was pretty consistent across the three groups. Importantly, the youthful offenders groups um, 
with, were very small, so some of those numbers are, are pretty large differences, but that's a statistical issue. Just to recap, um, we saw during pretrial supervision that the ATI folks that were successful were less likely to be arrested. There was no difference across when we, when we looked at the full sample, but among successful folks, they were less likely to be arrested. So no additional risk um, to the community. Um, participants, whether or not they were successfully completed the program, were employed a greater percentage of days. So if we're thinking that of as positive, we see effects there. Um, they were less likely to test for illicit substances as a percentage of total tests. There was no impact or no relationship with FTR technical violations. Those that completed the program had superior outcomes than just the general population, which is an important point because that begs the question of what allows people to be successful in these programs. And when it comes to sentencing and disposition, that 50% that were dismissed um, is the, the striking part of this, I think, that just dismissed outright, saving costs and time and a, a lot of things there. From here, where are we going? We've signed on a couple more districts to be part of this, including brand new programs and other established programs. Um, we're going to look at the long-term effects, so I'm just trying to figure out who of all these people have actually been out of the system long enough to track long-term recidivism. So do these effects hold when we look at some of those long-term things um, among federal defendants or, or federal offenders at that point? We're gonna start to actually take a look at those cost savings. I highlighted some points where we believe cost savings exist, but actually trying to quantify that in some way, which can be difficult. Um, and then there's this real interest, at least among chiefs, looking at some of what we call soft outcomes, at least that's what Chris calls them, um, these quality of life things, so perceptions of fairness, attitudes towards authority, quality of employment, so all these other things that those in the field know that these programs might impact, but we don't have data in PACs. So thinking of a survey or something like that to really get at some of these other outcomes that might be interested or interesting to folks to point to this impact. Um, so that's where we're going from here. So significantly different outcomes. Um, when you talk about alternatives to incarceration, none of the matched people were dismissed. About 50% of those in our group were. Uh, about 20-something percent of our group went to prison and 80% something in that area went to prison. Of matched people hitting on 21 different um, characteristics. So it's making a difference. Does everybody in a, a federal ATI program need the support of, say, the judicial team approach, which is highly labor intensive, to succeed? Probably not. Um, but who does and who doesn't? Uh, I would say anecdotally we know a significant number of them, and this, this type of study is demonstrating that. And this is the type of thing our administrative office and our judicial conference needs to see more data to take a, a better look at it before they would do something like fund us better for um, for these programmings. But um, you know, we were the the judges were speaking about these programs yesterday. Um, we're uh, our our budgets, our normal budgets, are being used for this treatment. The pretrial and probation budgets are being used for this treatment and frankly in this opioid crisis we're blowing out our budgets on treatment but that's happening in general um, but our our uh, resources are stretched thin so we need to know um, whether they work and whether it really makes a difference because if so we really need more manageable uh, caseload sizes and things like that big policy decisions so Mark Jelli still got it right I know, I'm two for two. Um, these programs in, in New Jersey and Brooklyn, um, we modeled ours after the Brooklyn program, um, and we heard Judge Gleason talk about it last night. Um, they're only touching about 100 people right now, um, and we have a whole lot of uh, persons under supervision, both, pre both pretrial and post-conviction. So what about the rest of these people? 
So thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I'm the deputy chief of the uh, probation department in the Eastern District of New York. I oversee uh, the pre-sentence division, which is sort of the front end part of the sentencing process. I also see part of, oversee part of the uh, supervision division, which is sort of the post-conviction side, along with Richard James, who's sitting right in front of me. And I also want to acknowledge our acting chief, uh, Vito Quatero, who are both here on and have been an important part of uh, this process uh, and some of the things that I'd like to talk about. Uh, very quickly, very quickly, I know time is strapped and I know that Chris is going to have to pull me off with uh, a cane very shortly, but I do want to just, for those of you who are unaware of what the Eastern District of New York is or covers, uh, it's that little slither right there uh, at the bottom of the state of New York. Uh, perhaps even a better uh, perspective of it is that little slither all the way out there that juts out into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, however, on that island right there, as well as Staten Island, which I will acknowledge also is in the Eastern District of New York, um, uh, has 8.5 million people. Uh, that is almost half the state's population. Uh, in fact, if it were a standalone state, it would be the 13th largest state in the country. But even more important than that, there are 3.5 million more people in the Eastern District of New York than in the Southern District of New York. I just always have to take a shot at that. <laughs> uh, so we have a very diverse um, and uh, very populated uh, geographic area and also very diverse demographic. Uh, with that said, I do want to talk about some of the things that uh, Chris was mentioning a moment ago. Uh, we've always sort of viewed ourselves in the Eastern District of New York uh, as being trailblazers, and a lot of that has to do with our bench. Um, they have never been afraid to sort of think outside of the box. They've been very progressive uh, in the way that they view this very, very important topic of sentencing. Um, so I sort of want to deal with this in a, a kind of temporal, logical way, sort of from the front end and how this sort of transitions to our back end. <clears throat> and more from a sort of probation uh, perspective. So the first thing I want to mention is we were the first district uh, to have a drug court. Um, it was established by the late uh, Judge Sifton in 2002. Uh, we have four specialty courts at the present time, two which overlap with uh, pretrial services. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge Robert Cordero, um, who is the chief of pretrial services in the Eastern District of New York, who has been incredibly instrumental in the success of these courts. Uh, so we do have acronyms, right, on the federal level. Uh, we have the SOS program, uh, which is uh, the brainchild of a fairly obscure, unknown judge named Jack Weinstein. Um, and it, it targets young adults from ages 18 to 25 uh, who would benefit from structure and direction. We also have another uh, uh, specialty court that overlaps with pretrial there, <clears throat> which is called, the, our, our side of the court is called REAP. Uh, again, another acronym uh, with the POP program, which in fact was overseen by Judge Gleason uh, when he was with us. Not, not that he's passed away, he's just no longer with the Eastern District of New York. Um, and then we have two independent um, uh, reentry drug courts, uh, which we call STAR Supervision to Aid uh, Reentry. One of them is overseen by our chief judge, uh, Dora Irizarry, and the other is overseen by um, Magistrate Judge Levy. Uh, we have also seen uh, success with respect to these courts. Again, we're talking about fairly small numbers, but we've had success rates uh, since their inception somewhere in the uh, high 60s uh, percent uh, success rate. So, um, and, and as Kevin mentioned, which I, I just want to sort of, um, I, I, I feel is important to mention in this, uh, they have shown some success in a number of ways that we would measure success, uh, whether it's a greater degree of employment, um, testing positive less than, than, uh, than others. Uh, so there is something to be said about um, these courts being somewhat promising at this point. Um, one other thing I do want to mention is the courts that overlap, our courts on the post-conviction side that overlap with the, the pretrial side. We have officers on both sides. So we have pretrial services officers as well as 
uh, post-conviction officers sitting in on these courts so that we have a transition for those, in fact, uh, the cases that are not dismissed and ultimately proceed to sentencing. They are, as Kevin mentioned a moment ago, receiving at a greater degree non-custodial sentences as well as significantly less sentences. But we have officers on the supervision side sitting in on those courts so that there's a smoother transition to supervision on, on the post-conviction end. So sort of moving along, uh, along our line, our sort of sentencing line, um, there's so much to talk about this little pie chart, but I'm gonna try to limit my, uh, my comments to all of this. Um, I, I, I think what this underscores is, again, sort of the courage of the bench in, in the Eastern District of New York. Um, they, they I, I don't think, have ever been afraid to, to go out, uh, to think outside of the box and to give sentences outside of the guideline range. And that's even when we had a mandatory guideline regime. I think we were ahead of the curve in terms of uh, how often departures were used and how uh, innovative uh, they came up with departures. Uh, and, and this, I think, also speaks to the way that we've approached uh, sentencing from the front end all the way to the back end. This idea of individualized sentencing, which is a very, very key element here. And, and as I mentioned a moment ago, during the mandatory regime, it, it was, I don't wanna say non-existent, this idea of individualized sentencing, but it certainly was limited. Um, Post Booker, um, this is something where I think uh, our court has found this newfound discretion and has used it in a really significant and meaningful way. Meaningful way. Uh, we, we see here by this pie chart, um, downward variances in excess of 40%, uh, downward departures, uh, along with downward departures, now we're talking about in excess of 50% and then with government sponsored uh, downward, um, downward departures. We're talking about 75% of the cases that are below the guideline range, um, and only 25% within the guideline range. This speaks to a number of things, and I, I, just so that you have this in proper context, the downward variance rate, the national downward variance rate, is somewhere around 17%. Uh, within guideline range on the national level is slightly above 50%. So this obviously is, is telling you that uh, our bench, and I'd like to think we have something to do with that in terms of our recommendations, are, are thinking about sentencing in a far more meaningful way. Um, and um, it's resulting in and again, we've heard some of them is nationally speaking, we typically place well below some of the national standards when we're talking about incarceration rates. And um, it's, it's imposing sentences that are at a greater rate, uh, non-custodial, as well as uh, less time uh, incarceration rates. So uh, that we're seeing a positive element as a, as a result of that too. Sort of moving forward in terms of uh, the back end of our sentencing process. Uh, we're not alone in this. Uh, we use a risk assessment tool, but this is sort of an individualized way of supervising individuals on both probation and supervised release. Again, we do this in sort of a data-informed way. Uh, PICRA is an evidence-based, dynamic risk assessment tool. Uh, it relies on data elements like criminal history, peer associations, substance abuse, employment, education, among other things. PICRA has provided it's sort of taken the, the Booker element on the front ends of sentencing and sort of provided um, this, I, this individualization on the post-conviction side too. How we go about supervising people, to what extent we go about supervising people. Um, and so this provides a risk assessment, but also uh, it allows for supervision to be commensurate with that risk and the needs of the individual. Uh, quite honestly, it showed uh, PICRA did, as well as uh, various, uh, various information evidence-based, showed that we were over-supervising a large percentage of the folks that we had on supervision. So uh, we've also uh, looked at some of the data uh, that was provided by both the Sentencing Commission, which I will be honest, we initially, I think, ignored, uh, but then was uh, supported by not only PICRA, but by other evidence-based research, 
uh, that the terms of supervision were too long, um, and how this was be how this was uh, counterproductive in terms of successfully supervising uh, folks as well as them uh, being successful on supervised release, and and so. Uh, I had my IT group run this, and you can see that our uh, terms of supervised release, what has been imposed over the last five years, you can see that it's precipitously dropped uh, from 39 months to 28 months in that five-year time frame. It wasn't long ago uh, that we imposed, or we recommended, I should say, judges impose, of course, uh, we recommended the highest amounts uh, that the maximum amount of supervised release uh, and, the, and the maximum amount of probation on any case uh, that we recommended to the court. Uh, and it wasn't uncommon for the judges uh, to impose those recommendations. Um, in addition to that, we laden these long terms of supervised release and probation with a number of conditions. Um, and so some of the things that Chris was mentioning a moment ago in, in terms of over conditioning and, and over supervising folks, that's in fact what was occurring. Uh, and we've absolutely stepped away from that um, within the last few years. Um, how am I doing on time? We're running. Sorry. Okay, two seconds. Let me just get through, I, I assure you. So we're employing all of these alternatives. I just wanna give them the da 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 da, -da moment. Um, so we're reducing the number of people um, receiving custodial terms, overall lowering the amount of time uh, that we're imposing in terms of sentence, uh, reducing where appropriate the overall supervision of individuals, lowering the terms of supervised release and probation, um, reducing the number of conditions, um, and, uh, and I neglected to mention we're also moving to terminate uh, early supervised release and probation on the appropriate offenders. So uh, have we become the wild, wild west? No, we have not. I guess it would be the wild, wild east since we're the Eastern District of New York. Um, so you can see by our, our re-arrest rates, these numbers have dropped uh, in the last five years. And likewise, when we're talking about uh, uh, post-conviction outcomes and revocation, Ours is well below the national average, well below the Second Circuit, and of course, below the Southern District of New York also. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I just wanna, I wanna add with this, this is a, uh, this is a process, um, and um, it's not an easy fix, uh, and, and I can assure you it's not a perfect fix, uh, but we continue to sort of rethink the way that we do business, and I think we must. Uh, but we've seen both uh, positive and, and promising results. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Vinny, um, former New York City uh, probation commissioner, so you must think uh, community supervision is the panacea to all of this? Exactly. Well, that's a layup. Uh, hi, everybody. My dog ate my PowerPoint, so I'm just going to sit here and talk. Uh, and. Um, I'll talk a little about the history of probation and parole, kind of how it evolved to where it is currently, uh, which I think is not a very good place, so I'll give you a little premonition, um, and then uh, make some uh, recommendations as to how it, I think, could be make less punitive, smaller, and more decent. Um, so 1800s was when we were inventing a whole bunch of things, the juvenile court, penitentiaries, probation, parole, 1846, a uh, bootmaker in Boston invented probation, John Augustus, uh, criminologist and uh, uh, warden of Elmira Penitentiary invented the U.S. version of parole. Uh, uh, Zebulon Brockway in 1876, and and both men were very um, uh, believed in mercy. It was a very hyper individualized approach. Brockway didn't think all people in prison were the same. Some of them worked harder. Some of them played by the rules. Felt that those people should be able to get out earlier by by doing so, uh, but only but conditionally. And um, uh, Augustus was very. Um, in, involved in a temperance movement, and he was uh, working with the courts to provide an alternative to pillory and the stocks, and uh, uh, by giving supervision and bringing people back, changed men and women. Uh, and, and 
This sort of rehabilitative and individualistic approach permeated the field all the way up until the uh, uh, 1970s when it ran sort of smack into mass incarceration. Now, imperfectly so, obviously. There were plenty of problems uh, with probation and parole in prisons, but they were still based on a rehabilitative ethic and an individualized one. Eight, uh, 1970s, uh, two major factors came into play. One was um, the Southern strategy during which uh, efforts were made by the Nixon administration and others to racialize criminal justice policy and welfare policy to sort of make uh, 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 issues of race seem race neutral while targeting uh, people of color. Uh, and then uh, an obscure New York researcher named Robert Martinson joined a team of uh, CUNY, City University of New York researchers, studying in prison programs so they could recommend to the Department of Corrections which ones they should use and which ones they shouldn't use. Uh, and yeah, sort of a fair look at that report showed that some programs worked, some programs didn't work, the ones that didn't work might not have worked because they weren't well studied enough or because they weren't funded well enough. Uh, but Martinson himself got ahead of his team, came out and said nothing works, and that was sort of leapt on by the folks that were trying to implement the Southern strategy so that uh, you, the, 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 the uh, Republican Party could have a wedge issue to attract uh, Southern whites and suburban Northern whites to sort of bring them in uh, in ways that were difficult up to that point in time. So this affected the whole field. The Martinson Report was, uh, for a time, the most cited criminology, uh, criminological report uh, in the country. Uh, Martinson was on the front page of Time Magazine, 60 Minutes, heady stuff for a criminologist in the 1970s, heady stuff for a criminologist today. Um, and um, later on, he recanted and said that, that you know, that his, uh, it wasn't even his study, it was uh, Mark Lipsy's study, but uh, was the lead researcher, didn't really show that nothing works. Somebody once asked him, well, what should I tell my students now? And he said, just tell them I was full of crap. Uh, but this, this had a profound effect on the field. Prisons still had many elements of sentencing to fall back on. They were still places of punishment, incapacitation, deterrence. We didn't have that. The probation field was pretty much sinking or swimming on whether we could turn people's lives around and help them make it in the community and rehabilitate them. So the field really shifted its focus at that time got much more punitive, started calling ourselves community corrections. The things we did were called intermediate sanctions. And we um, you know, started running boot camps, putting electronic monitors on people, and started to grow massively. So we, we did preserve our market share in doing so, uh, but only in terms of bodies, not money. Uh, so prisons grew by about fivefold. Probation and parole grew fourfold. Today, even though we're very understudied and very under looked at by advocates, we have twice as many people on probation and parole, about 4.5 million people as are uh, in prison. It's about 2.2 million people in prison. So 4.5 million people is more people than live in most United States states. So very big, very ignored part of the system. When I interviewed for my job with Mayor Bloomberg, I really honestly think he cared more about what high school I went to than what I was gonna do about probation in New York City. And I feel like I could have slept through my four years of probation and even nobody would have pretty much noticed. Um, and that's, that's too bad because 4.5 million people, it's not an inconsequential number of people. The courts rely on us. Not an extraordinary amount. Uh, so you think about where are we right now? What are we supposed to do with probation and parole? I think most people within the system and outside the system kind of think of us as doing two things. We're supposed to keep the community safe by helping surveil and turn people's lives around, and we're supposed to divert people from incarceration. Not a ton of evidence that we do either of those things. So let me just pause over that. It's been a fourfold growth in probation and parole. If we were diverting people from prison, You'd think there'd been a decline in incarceration during that time. You'd think that places that had more probation and parole would have lower incarceration rates, or as they grew, would have fewer people 
under, uh, in, in incarcerated, none of that's true, and there's no evidence writ large, not individually, sometimes good programs do good things, sometimes judges actually divert people by putting them on probation, but writ large, not a hell of a lot of evidence that uh, more people on probation means either more safety or fewer people incarcerated. Uh, I only got one minute left, she keeps waving that thing at me, so I'm gonna get to my recommendations super quick, and they are. Uh, I think that uh, as a society, we need to substantially reduce the amount of time people are on probation, like you talked about, uh, the number of people are on probation. I think we should be putting more people on conditional discharges or just releasing them outright uh, when we don't incarcerate them. Uh, we need to let people off early uh, for good behavior like we do from jail and prison. Lots of states with Pew's help have begun to give people 30 days off for every 30 days they either don't get rearrested or don't get a violation. Um, uh, we need to cap violation terms. There's been some interesting caps on violation terms. I mean, Louisiana is just like crazy. Uh, they got like seven days, zero days on your first two technicals, seven days, 15 days, and 30 days after that, never more than 30 days on a technical. It's just a wake up call for people who the judge originally thought could make it in the community, but it's not something that's gonna cripple them for the rest of their lives. A guy I met recently who got a night job, got violated because he was working his night job, even though his original PO said it was okay, but the next PO said it wasn't okay, whatever, uh, got 90 days on the revocation, he had no new crimes. He said, when I went in, I had a job, a girlfriend, an apartment, and a car. When I came out, I had none of those things. These folks are on the edge. And he wasn't even bitter about it. I was sort of stunned. Uh, by how calm he was about it, and he was just got a job, got an apartment, was starting to get himself a car, girlfriend. He was sort of working to pull his back, life back together. Um, the council of state governments today uh, came out with findings that 45% uh, of people uh, in prison in America uh, went in on a violation. 25% of people in prison in America went in on a technical violation. The 45% cost 9.3 billion with a billion dollars a year. So if we could reduce that, uh, I think what we really need to do is help reduce caseloads. Some of the caseloads are massive that uh, POs have and capture some of those savings and get for things like housing and employment and education and, uh, and substance abuse treatment and mental health counseling, the kind of things folks on probation and parole need. If I was to recommend to a bunch of judges and prosecutors what to do, I would say exercise parsimony when you give out terms and when you give out conditions. I would suggest starting literally at zero conditions and working your way up to whatever number you come to based on the connectedness between the condition and why the person committed the crime. And if there isn't a condition, just don't make it a standard condition. Judge Weinstein, who was mentioned earlier, came out recently, there was an article in the Times, one of his uh, written opinions, he said he wasn't going to test people or violate people for marijuana anymore. Are we really violating for people for marijuana? And you probably don't do a lot of it, but people do it. And if it's connected with their crime, eh, maybe that's an okay thing. But if it's not, we shouldn't even be testing for marijuana. I stopped testing my folks on uh, my department for marijuana and did a bunch of other things, had a 45% reduction in uh, technical violations. Just one final thing. Um, New York has 70,000 people on probation, New York City. Uh, now we have 20,000-ish people on probation. Uh, look outside. Looks pretty good out there. Not like, you know, people are rummaging in the streets, public safety. This was at a time when crime declined by 53% and the number of pre people in Rikers declined by two-thirds. So neither does it seem to have jeopardized public safety in New York City, nor does it seem to have contributed to more people going to prison on the theory that uh, probation equals more incarceration. I think we could do substantially better in this area as a nation, uh, incrementally better, uh, and, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thanks a lot. It's actually a comment and not a question. You, you asked the question with respect to the pretrial diversion programs, whether the people in the programs were really needed the services that were being provided. And obviously, 
every one of the programs being studied there in my district is one of them has different you know uh, standards for their acceptance but at least in our district we don't accept anyone who we don't believe would otherwise go to prison if convicted and we generally try not to accept anyone into our program who we don't think we can really change something with respect to their current situation so we don't we try not to accept the people who don't need the level of services that we're offering but i know that every program is different thank you i sit in the appellate mid-level appellate court in new york state um i'm very intrigued by so some of what you said in particular most many crimes in new york have recommended periods of incarceration and periods of post-release supervision. And it seems to me that many trial courts routinely give, even if they give a somewhat towards the minimum of the period of incarceration, give the maximum period of post-release supervision. And the appellate courts often routinely affirm those. From what you're saying, that makes no sense. Am I missing something? And is there any <laughs> lobbying effort to change any of that if I'm not missing something? Yeah, I think there's been a sense amongst people in the field that judges, parole authorities, legislators, um, think that if some supervision is good, more supervision must be right. better. And that's understandable, but it's just not true. The, the impact starts to wane after a year or two. The American Law Institute recommends three years for felonies, one year for misdemeanors and also that you're able to work your way off of it, like really like, like what, what Mark described in terms of being able to shorten both the term, but then also you did well so you get off right. early. That's much better than just slapping some lengthy period of time. If folks are doing good, I, I, I don't know if you can imagine a bigger waste of public dollars than the conversation that goes on in the fifth year of somebody's probation <laughs> when they've been doing good for five years but they gotta go, they gotta sit in the waiting room with a whole bunch of other guys, they gotta miss work, you know, if something goes wrong, they never know when they're gonna run afoul of an angry probation officer who might violate him for something stupid. It's, and, and it takes away from our ability to focus on the people that actually really need both our supervision and our help. So sh less is more when it comes to this, and there's a bill in New York called Less is More, which would actually right. supervise, right. would actually reduce terms and give 30 days off for every 30 days violation free. I, I was just gonna add to that, but then you said it also. <laughs> and, and I think it's intuitive, right? You think, well, I'm gonna reduce this, so I'm going to uh, add to this, so that I somehow right, hit right. this Goldilocks effect with respect to the appropriate punishment right. here. And, and the reality is it does wane. Uh, you know, we're looking at, if there are issues within supervision, it's going to be sort of front end and then at that point in time, quite honestly, it is a, a waste of resources, personnel, time, and a number of other things that we probably should be using somewhere else. And real quick, in, in response to your comment, um, we have a drug court. They're all serious addicts that need a lot of services, and we provide a lot of services. What I'm saying is, is it possible that some of these people, without an AT program, they all would have gone to prison. That's clear from our study. What I'm saying is maybe we don't need to be sending them to prison and just provide the services and think about different ways of doing this. And maybe everybody doesn't need to be sitting with Judge Salas at the table and can still be successful and still not go to prison. That's what we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you.